Hey, welcome to The Weekly, where we connect what happened over the weekend in our services here at Calvary to your real life lived Monday through Friday. I'm one of your hosts, Thomas Milburn. Pastor Jay Ewing is out of studio today, but we are joined by the infamous Perry Marshall. Hey, Thomas. How you're are so, you? Good. You're so you're so famous. You're infamous. Yeah. Uh, let me think about that for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing good. Okay. How are you doing? I'm well, man. It is. It's been a good week. Good week. And the weekend is uh, coming up. And I gotta admit, I'm excited about that. Yeah. It is election week here in America. Really? It, yeah. And actually, um, I want to just put some breaking presidential news out there for all of our listeners. I haven't seen this reported anywhere, but it is most certainly true the presidential race of kanye west is over it's he is no longer a viable option to be the next president of america Uh, oh 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 man that's that's tough i kind of wish you wouldn't have told me that it does kind of it it lays heavy yeah okay well let's let's try to carry on anyways (laughs) Whew, that's tough, man. All right, so it is presidential week. There is still a lot to be out there uh, decided, and we are waiting to see what votes come in and what happens over the next few days and even weeks and potentially months. So remember what we're praying for here at Calvary. We're praying for unity of the church. We're praying for our witness in our community, and we're praying for God's intervention in our country. We really want God to recapture the heart of our country that we would love and follow Jesus Christ. And that's what we're passionate about, and that's why we gather on Sundays, and that's what this weekly podcast is all about, is how do we follow Jesus Christ most closely, and taking what we heard and dialogued about with in our home groups, and how do we live that out uh, in our real life. So this Sunday, we were in Acts chapter 20, and we were talking about idols. How was your home group, Perry? It was great. It was great. I mean, that passage has so much crammed into it that is really uh, easy to talk about, especially when you start talking about idolatry. Uh, That's a topic that can uh, be something that kind of pokes people where they um, don't want to be poked sometimes. And it can uh, can really just lead to conversations that um, are challenging, but I think really fruitful too when you, you start digging into what's going, what are people's motivations, what are, what's driving people in life, and um, idolatry can help bring out a conversation that can really be significant. All right, so that's the conversation we want to have today, a little bit more about idolatry, how to recognize idols in our life, and, and how to remove idols in our life, so we prize Jesus Christ as ultimate. Um, we had both talked about our, uh, this book by Tim Keller, Counterfeit Gods, as being a helpful resource. Um, as we def- redefine like what idols are Perry, what would you glean from Tim Keller again to help us get our head around what are idols? Yeah, I think Keller has several different quotes that are pretty well known if you've read any of his stuff. Um, One one thing that he says is that it's anything more fundamental than God to your happiness, meaning in life or identity. So idols are not bad things. Um, They can be good things, um, but they are turned into ultimate things. And they replace God. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we had said they replace God in the sense that you begin to turn worship, your devotion, time, direction towards these things in hopes of receiving back from them identity, significance, security. Um, that's what you're trying to glean from an idol that's right. ultimate in your life. Right. What else does Keller say that has been helpful? Well, Keller, I, this this might be your line. I don't know if this is your line or Keller's line, but when you start... Let's just give it to Keller. (laughs) This is just like out there for anyone ever listening to me at Counter Bible Church. Yeah. If you hear something that I say and you think, wow, that was really great, and then you read it somewhere else and think, they stole that from Thomas, just pause (laughs) and assume I stole it from them. Yeah. Well, it's amazing how many people must listen to you. Because I, I keep hearing your stuff everywhere. It's, <laughs> it's out there, brother. Uh, so another way of putting it that you brought up in the sermon is that idols are things that overpromise and underdeliver. Like a Nicolas Cage like movie. Like a Nicolas Cage movie. And I'm kind of a, I, th- I think there's some examples that really go against the grain of that expression, Thomas. Like, what about The Rock? Yeah. I, I had on for- air? Come on, man. I know. My home group started talking about movies of Nicolas Cage. I was like, actually, 
He has some pretty solid ones out there. So <laughs> maybe a better example could have been like Steven Seagal. Ah, uh, aha. Uh-huh. Maybe. I don't know. You're dating yourself, though. There are probably some younger people who, yeah. who have no idea who you're talking about. Yeah, that's true. I don't know who who I would throw out now. That's okay. That's it's okay. We get the picture, you know. It's but the, the overpromising is, hey, you're going to find your true identity. Mm-hmm. You're going to be secure in this. If you could just only have this, if you could only acquire this, if only you could be associated with this, then you're going to be okay. Yeah. And then you believe that. Yeah. And that's where the idol piece comes in. And you've just described America. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's what our, our society is sustained by, in some ways, that very mentality of all of the marketing that goes on that, that tells us, hey, you, your life will be better if you could acquire this, if you could achieve that. Your life will be better. And our whole society and our hearts, it turns out, runs on that kind of fuel. Yeah, you know, John Calvin had this quote that I was going to slide into the sermon that it's just super helpful and say, like, idol worship isn't, you know, an alternative lifestyle as though you can opt in or opt out of it. John Calvin says, man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. Mm. That my heart is just an idol factory. That I am constantly producing affections for things if they're not for God. So God has created us to be worshipers. Like it's in our DNA. We, we often say here at Calvary, worship is not a spiritual activity. It is a human activity mm-hmm. to find something worthy of your worship is worship that you say, I'm going to give my life to my attention to my devotion to my time to that's because in your heart, it's producing constantly yeah. idols to turn that worship in which you've been made for too. And God says, okay, you're only going to find the true sense of who you are, of finding satisfaction, fulfillment, purpose, security, when you turn those natural worship tendencies of being a human being to worship the creator who made you. Yeah. Yeah. Worshiping the creation over the creator. It's something that's plagued us ever since Genesis three, right? It goes all the way back into the early pages of the old Testament uh, you see the prohibition against making any kind of an image of God because that image is always going to misrepresent who God is. You see um, the prohibition when Israel is going to enter into the promised land and in multiple places you have God warning his people to not be too close to the people around them who are going to um, potentially sway their hearts away from the worship of God to idols to their own ways, their own, their own practices. And of course, that is the very thing that we see happening to God's people when they do enter the land and start mixing in with the people around them. You know, that early uh, Jewish history was a conversation I was listening to this week between two Old Testament scholars in the sphere of what makes God angry. We're talking about why, why does God appear to be so wrathful in the Old Testament? Yeah. And we were talking about what, what causes him to pour out his wrath on his own people at times. And these two ultimate Old Testament scholars kind of boil it down to two categories of God's wrath. Like, if you want to know what really upsets God, if you're his people, there are two categories that, that will infuriate him. One is idol worship, is telling his people that you should have nothing above me. There's no gods before me. That I am the God, I'm your God, I brought you out of freedom, or out of slavery into freedom to a land of promise. And there's going to be other lands, other cultures that are, like you're saying, are filled with other gods. Those are little G gods, and none of them should be elevated above me. Mm-hmm. And the second thing, if the first is idol worship, the second is injustice. Yeah. God, God's heart beats for justice. Yeah. And when you open up the prophets, and you open up Isaiah and Jeremiah, just in the very first pages in the opening chapters, here's God speaking directly to his people through the prophets saying, I'm so tired of your religious ceremonies and services. I'm tired of your burnt offerings. I'm tired of watching your worship services because of these two things. Yeah. Something else has captured your heart. Where, where did you go? You have yeah. turned away from me to worthless things. And you no longer plead the case of the widow, the right. orphan, to loosen chains of, those, of injustice. Why don't you wash yourself of these things and return to me and to right. my purposes? 
Yeah, and if you're looking for a great example of that kind of um, language in the Old Testament, turn to Isaiah 58. That's just one example. That's one chapter out of all of the Old Testament where you can see um, exactly what you're talking about right there, Thomas. It, it plays out right there. Um, so that's great. That's super abstract, though. Yeah, for, for sure. For my world. In here in the 21st century, I... I hear about that. I, you know, I can read about this stuff from thousands of years ago and say, wow, yeah, that was really a problem then. Yeah, okay, it, great. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem for me today. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of, the, one of the emails I got this week. You know, I'm so thankful for the emails that you guys send in to the weekly at calvarybible.com or even the emails you send to me personally to help clarify um, or even just to send a note of encouragement or even a, a note of objection so thankful for communication because that's how we grow is dialoguing about these things. Um, but someone said it was really helpful for me to have your sarcasm come through thick on Sunday uh, <laughs> saying how, how foolish are those people in the old days yeah. that loved things of wood, metal, fabrics, yeah. and stones, and then to turn it on its head to say, oh, man, do you see my hardwood floors <laughs> and my mixed metal finishes? No. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of silly, but it's, it's just a reminder that, you know what? Yeah. Our hearts haven't changed. We're idol factories, and yeah. we're going to try to love something. So, yes, let's try to make this as practical as possible. Yeah. So, Acts chapter 20, here's Paul um, in Ephesus. In Ephesus, the majority cultural view is idol worship. So, I think it's important to remember that whenever we attack the idea of idols in our life, you're always going to be in the minority mm-hmm. oppressed view. Yeah. And so, here comes Paul from a minority view of saying we should stop worshiping the things that culture worships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the unpacking of it in Acts 20 is it's not so much the worship of Artemis, but what we see here in Demetrius' heart is the worship, the security, the identity, the purpose that he gets out of making these silver shrines Mm -hmm. in connection with the worship of Artemis. And so he feels threatened because those in his community are worshiping this Jesus Christ as opposed to Artemis, and it's affecting his business. Yeah, and, you know, I think, truthfully, Demetrius should be a little paranoid because um, it's not like this is a completely baseless threat to his way of life and to the, the even the way of life and the prosperity in the place of Ephesus in that day. Ephesus is known as being the kind of seat of where Artemis resides with, with the temple there to Artemis. And Demetrius is seeing what's going on around him. He's actually very perceptive and recognizing the threat to himself personally. But then you hear in his, the way he stirs up the mob, stirs up the crowd, he, he makes it more than much, about much more than just himself. He makes it about the whole city. And rightfully so, because Paul has been in Ephesus now for some time. And during his time there, um, he has seen people turn from idols. And if people turn from idols, if enough of that happens, then guess what that means for Demetrius? Guess what that might mean for Ephesus itself? And so when people come to Christ, when they're exposed to the gospel and they start to turn away from those idols, it does change a, a whole city. It can change a whole society. And it's, it's a powerful work that God does. And it's interesting how in that chapter, Paul is focused on the gospel, on having people from even the whole region come and hear um, this gospel message that Paul is proclaiming. And as he does that, as he focuses on Christ, you start to see people turn away from the idols. It's just a fascinating account of how the gospel doesn't just change lives, but it actually changes the whole makeup of a community of people itself, too. Yeah, you know, that point where... The, the, the culture begins to sense the change, feel the change, and ultimately is changed because Christians take their discipleship seriously yeah. is, a, is a profound point yeah. that we really want to be serious about this issue, not simply because we're trying to do the right thing or be obedient to, to God, which is yeah. really, really important, but also I want to change my culture, my community, my family, and the, my devotion to Christ does that. Yeah. So, no, I agree with you. I mean, Demetrius definitely has um, reason to be concerned, mm-hmm. right? He does. The, the lie in there is, if I lose this, then yeah. I won't be able to provide for my family. Right. We're not going to be okay. 
Right. Ephesus won't be okay. Definitely. And what Paul has to step in, probably eventually to teach the, the, the church in Ephesus, is this. You think you're losing, but you're really gaining. Yeah. This was the message of Jesus, right? Everyone, everyone wants to save their life. So whoever wants to save their life, well, that's all of us. If you lose it in a certain way, you'll really gain it. But if you are holding on to it and you will not loosen your grip on it so that you can hold fast to me, the ultimate loss will come in your, your way. And so you're going to have to learn that God is something so much greater. And you, what seems to be a loss is actually going to be a fundamental, life-changing, ultimate, eternal gain in Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. There's something about that, that response that we see in Demetrius that I think is instructive for us today. And that's, he, he emotionally um, goes into kind of a rage here. Uh, it, it bothers him in, in intensely. And I think there's something there when we try to ask the question, so how do we identify the idols in our own life? Uh, what does that look like for us? I think there's something there about that emotional response that when we start to be bothered by it, by the, even the, the implication that maybe this is a problem for us, that our heart is truly going after fill in the blank more than after Christ, uh, that can stir something up in us too where we react against it, similar to how we, we see Demetrius doing in this chapter in Acts. Thomas, have you seen people or, have you, or have, you, have you experienced that in your own life where you've kind of been confronted with this possibility that has stirred up some kind of an emotional response, either in yourself or in somebody around you? Yeah, for sure. I think we should always ask the question, why am I so upset? Um, this is the part that we were talking about Demetrius. He's so upset. He's enraged. He's, he's doing these things in his community. And we connected that with, you know, if you want to figure out what your idols are, oftentimes, this is, this is a direct parallel, always correlated, but just, you know, a light on the dashboard a lot of the dashboard can be when people get closer and closer to identifying what you truly worship, what you truly love, what is ultimate in your life, we will often become more and more defensive of it. And so we see Demetrius here defending it for good reasons. Oh, this is our livelihood. This is our community. This is our culture. People will lose our status. Some of those things are really good reasons. And so he's trying to excuse away why we should keep idols in our life. And so to kind of poke at the bear um, in the, the American church and to kind of lead into a discussion in your home group of what do you think American idols are, we talked about the outrage we saw at a uh, fast food chicken restaurant. And everyone kind of wrote in about Chick-fil-A. I was totally talking about Popeye's. Oh, I thought it was KFC. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay. It, right, so it, it's, it's Chick-fil-A. Um, and if you remember, this is several years back. There was some confusion about this. This isn't a pro-life issue. This was a, um, a marriage issue that in an interview, Dan Cathy, who uh, is the founder and leader of Chick-fil-A, expressed his personal views of what marriage is as a Christian. And he clarified that it has no persuasion over who he hires and why he hires and who he allows on staff and all of that. But he just expressed his personal views. And there was outlash from the community that the owner of Chick-fil-A would hold to a uh, traditional Judeo-Christian view of marriage between one man and one woman. Yeah. And the Christian community was, was outraged it for him and kind of stand, stood alongside him. And the parallel that we were trying to draw was, wasn't that that was necessarily wrong. You know, righteous anger is always, always good. Jesus shows us that he gets angry about things. The question that was being asked on Sunday was, that enthusiasm that we saw amongst the Christian community why has it not also been paralleled in many other issues that God really cares about concerning racial injustice or sanctity of life? Or if we say that we, we view marriage in this high regard, as we see in the Bible, then why are we not so enraged when there is similar statistics of divorce and pornography and adultery in Christian marriages as there are in the world? Should those things not also stir up in us the same frustration yeah. and energy? And if not, why not? Are there things that we really love that this is getting at? And so the question is, is always, why am I upset? Yeah. So when we talk about how to practically live this out, we should we should be really interested in why we're stirred up. So the next time we're stirred up, 
we should ask ourselves, okay, time out. Lord, search me and know me. Holy Spirit, would you, would you help me understand why am I so impassioned right now? What, yeah. what kingdom just got poked at? Um, yeah. Am I mad because the kingdom of Christ is somehow threatened? Am I mad because people are misconstruing what Jesus taught? Am I mad like Jesus was? That you, my house was supposed to be a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of thieves. Mm-hmm. Or am I enraged because there's something else that I have made you know, a good thing in my life, an ultimate thing in my life, and this is being threatened? Yeah. And it seems like, Thomas, that there's also a flip side to that too, where uh, it's equally emotional, but maybe it's a completely different emotion on the other end of the other end of the spectrum where we aren't bothered by something, but we are just captivated by something. Like we can't stop thinking about some option, event, possibility, um, possession, maybe um, achievement that's in our future, that's just on the horizon. And It just has a hold of us and we can't stop so excited and really um, that our interest in the things of God just kind of fades into the background. But of course, we're we're very good at talking ourselves into believing something that's not true. And so maybe we we can kind of baptize that thing that is distracting us from the gospel, distracting us from the Lord and um, just say, well, th- this is something that God wants for my life. I know it. And this is something that um, will make my family happier, or it's something that will give me all kinds of opportunities for new things in life, or this will make us more comfortable, you know, yada, 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 whatever you want to say, you can, you can um, start to justify the pursuit of things that don't just upset us um, in some way, but that can, that can just, um, overly excite us or overly capture our thoughts and our emotions. And, um, of course those things are also dangerous, but maybe they're, they're, they're just on the time scale. They're, we're not quite at the point where they are being threatened to be taken away from us yet. And that's what maybe makes us angry, but they're more like an opportunity in front of us and that makes us excited, but excited in a way that completely distorts or, or, um, obscures the gospel. Yeah, and I think that's the thing is is God wants to really protect his children, and yeah. he knows the best way to do that, whether you're trying to replace him or try to just enjoy something else that's, that's good in the world, is to keep him as the ultimate thing. If God is the ultimate thing in our life, then so many other things just find its proper place, mm-hmm. and we can actually enjoy them, like you're saying. Yeah. Um, I had a great conversation this week that came out of the discussion from Sunday of a gentleman saying, you know, I really prized this possession in my life as ultimate. I just knew it was the ultimate thing. And so I was so protective of keeping it safe and secure. And the problem was, because I was so concerned about keeping it safe and secure, I didn't enjoy it the way it was supposed to be enjoyed as just a good thing in my life. And once I recognized that and someone helped me replace that with God as, hey, listen, God is the ultimate thing in your life. Then it got a few scratches, but man, I got to really enjoy it and use it um, for what it was. And that's what it is. Mm -hmm. For what it is, it's not the ultimate thing. Right. And so I think that's like practically speaking, Perry, you know, how do you recognize idols in your life? I think you got to ask yourself, why why am I so impassioned or not Mm -hmm. impassioned? Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, but then also you can't just strip all idols out of your life. If you know that you're an idol factory, like you're a worshiper, always looking for something to worship. You have to increase your affections for the Lord. Otherwise, they're just going to be replaced by something else. Yeah, I think that that certainly comes out of this chapter in Acts, too. Again, when you read through that, and and maybe it's not so fresh in your minds because it was a few days ago, um, I'd encourage you, if you have a few minutes, go back and reread the chapter again. And just look for for what Luke actually says happened in Ephesus. Um, you don't see a lot of Paul going into the temple of Artemis and speaking against it, calling down lightning and thunder on to the temple of Artemis that it would just crumble to the ground. That's not what he's doing. Paul is instead giving his energy, his attention, all of his focus to the gospel, to preaching the gospel. And as he does that, God's supernatural work is happening in people's hearts and their minds and trans it trans transitions into their lives so that there's a, there is a transformation that takes place. And as that kind of transformation includes them 
than turning away from Artemis in the case of Ephesus or turning away from idols in general. And so our, our focus, the most powerful weapon that we should have and give our attention to is simply putting our focus on Christ, putting our, fixing our eyes on the work of Christ, on what he has done. And if you want to, if you want to make it even more concrete, let me just ask it this way. How much time are you spending consistently in God's word? How much time are you spending in prayer? How much time are you spending around God's people? Of course, it's not only about the amount of time, but it's also the kind of time you're spending too. How much, how much of your life, of your schedule, are you committing to things that will nurture, that will cultivate a love for the, a love for the Lord and a love and understanding of the gospel? That's right. Because at our best, we can direct our affections. Mm-hmm. And we need to direct them away from things that so easily entertain us, captivate us, but will never fulfill us. And we need to direct those desires and those, uh, those attentions of worship and all of our delights onto the Lord. Um, I'm not sure which pastor I probably robbed this from. It sounds like a John Piper thing. But God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Yeah. And so our aim is to be increasingly satisfied mm-hmm. in the sweetness of our Savior Jesus Christ. And the more that we are satisfied in him, the more that we reflect who he is to the people around us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so as you're, as you're thinking through those things, just everything we've talked about in this podcast, things that stick in your mind from the sermon, things that jump out to you at the passage if you get a chance to read through it again, um, remember that, that this is God's supernatural work that takes place in our lives. This isn't about us trying to transform ourselves. That's never... Um, that's never possible because um, we need God's supernatural work, his Holy Spirit, to be able to bring about the kind of change that we need, including the change to move away from idols to serve the one true living God. All right. Thanks for joining us today here on The Weekly. Perry, thanks for jumping in as Jay's been out. May I leave you with this as our confidence. Psalm 91, friends. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. For the Lord is our shelter. Amen.